Hello everyone. Last time we had started with the paper discussions. So we did about, did with the 2012 paper last time. So friends, as you people could see, there is a substantial number that is around 10 to 15 questions, which is asked from the area of labor laws, social security, and industrial relations, so to say. So therefore, this area should be done in detail because this is the area which can give you edge. Because a, a little amount of extra efforts in this area can yield you very disproportionately high results. Therefore, I would like you all to put in extra efforts in the coming days, take out at least two, three hours a day separately for this area. So last time, as we have already discussed the 2012 paper, you can see that video, you can try and you know make notes out of it so that you can revise at the end. Today, in a similar manner, we shall see the 2015 paper. And in that paper, what we shall do is, we shall try to see the options which have been given by the UPSC and we shall also try to explore the peripheries. And one more additional concepts, wherever there will be some need of a discussion of a concept, that is a fresh concept will need to be discussed, we shall also discuss that. Well, so let us start today's paper. Right, so friends, the first question is, it's a very easy question to begin with. The Maternity Benefit Act 1961 provides for how many weeks wages during the maternity period? So most of you must be knowing the answer. So however, what is important to know here is that this exam, when it was held in 2016, the answer was 12 weeks. But what is the answer now? If it is asked on 2nd July in the exam, the answer shall become 26 weeks. As we have already seen that very next year to it, that is in 2017 itself, the number of weeks were increased from 12 to 26. However, there are a few catches here that the number 26 shall be restricted to only two children. And if someone wants to avail maternity benefit for the third child, the number shall continue to be 12. Further, in case the woman is adopting mother or the woman is a commissioning mother. That is, she is going for surrogacy. In those cases as well, the benefit available shall be only for 12 weeks and not 26 weeks. However, if the question is asked in the same manner that the Maternity Benefit Act 1961 provides for how many weeks wages during the maternity period, the answer shall be 26 weeks now. Right. I hope this is clear. This is one of the social security legislations and it has been merged into the social security code now. Right. So 12 weeks is the answer for this. Let us see the next question. Which of the following are the instruments of providing social security in India? Again, it's a question which one can do with common sense. You don't need to have a very specific knowledge of social security or labor laws in this question. However, you have to know the word social security. What is the meaning of the term? So we have already discussed during our initial lectures that the word social security here stands for the security provided to individuals by the society. And well, the word society here should be the catch for you that it's not the economic security, right? Even if the benefit provided to the workers is in monetary term, we cannot call it economic security. The, the correct term is social security because the whole society takes the responsibility for social security of those who are disadvantaged. For those who cannot fend for themselves in their dire needs, the society had, has conjured a concept that is called as social security to provide the needs of such persons. Right. So let us see the options one by one now. What all are the instruments of providing? Right. Instruments of providing means we are, we have been asked about the instruments which are meant for providing social security. First option is income tax. So is income tax a measure of social security? Is it an instrument of providing social security? No, it cannot be so. However, imagine if the question is instruments for providing social security, then there would have been confusion. I hope you are understanding it. 
because the government might say that we are collecting income tax for providing social security in india right so in that case the confusion can be there however since it is instruments of providing social security therefore income tax gets eliminated that income tax is not an instrument of providing social security so what about the second one the employees provident fund yes definitely it is a measure of instrument of providing social security we have discussed the employees provident fund and miscellaneous provisions act 1952 in detail we have discussed about the employees provident fund scheme employees pension scheme and the employees deposit linked insurance scheme already so we are very sure that this is an instrument of providing social security the third is general sales tax again this is also like income tax back like any tax is not an instrument of providing social security however if we are asked is it if it is an instrument for providing social security yes there can be it can be said like that what about lic does lic provide social security yes lic does provide because insurance also is a tool for providing social security and insurance while you know getting insurances it allows withdrawal of money it allows you it allows the insured person to get through the tough phases get through the uneventful phases of life right so lic is also a measure of instrument of social security what about the national pension scheme is it a measure of social security yes it is because all the pension schemes if there is some amount of entitlement by the government that we can consider as instrument of providing social security what about the postal provident fund yes if it's a provident fund what is the word provident fund mean so if i can use hindi it means bhavishya nidhi that is a fund that is a corpus that you can use for future therefore the postal provident fund it is a provident fund and it is also taking care of future needs therefore it can also be considered as an instrument of providing social security so what is the answer we have we have to eliminate one and three so we are left with 2 4 5 6 so 2 4 5 6 is the answer so let us move to the third question consider the following statements regarding the pradhan mantri suraksha bima yojana read this as bima it's not bina suraksha bima yojana right so friends you you people must be aware in 2016 there were two schemes the pradhan mantri suraksha bima yojana and the pradhan mantri jeevan jyoti bima yojana right so those two both of them they are very important for this exam and coincidentally both of them were asked in the 2016 exam of apfc therefore what we can do is although upsc does not believe in repeating the questions however still we can read this in detail because it can be asked as options in other questions right so it's not that the same language or the same content of the question can be repeated some other provision pertaining to these two schemes can be asked right so still the schemes continue to hold importance for this apfc exam right so let us read the statements it is applicable for all bank account holders up to the age of 60 years right is it so, so are you many of you would have read the scheme and you must be aware about the age limits i mean what is the age limits for the pradhan mantri suraksha bima yojana and jeevan jyoti bima yojana so friends for suraksha bima yojana the age limit is 70 years it is not 60 because you know the trick to remember is since s is coming here in suraksha bima yojana for s you can take it as 70 so it is correlative therefore thus this way you can remember therefore the applicability for all bank holders up to the age of 70 60 years is false so only one statement has to be eliminated here so the answer easily becomes c further we can read the other statements as well it is a life insurance cover yes it is a life insurance cover in a way that in case of death due to accident there is compensation given of 2 lakh rupees we'll see the two schemes in detail we'll compare the two well 
so it can be called as a life insurance cover right it is an accident covers deaths and permanent disability due to accident yes it is true completely true we shall see the provisions so the answer should be 2 and 3 right so friends before we move on let us first do with the pradhan mantri jeevan jyoti bima yojana and pradhan mantri suraksha bima yojana right so let us see the provisions one by one the pradhan mantri jeevan jyoti bima yojana the annual installment or annual premium is rupees 330 rupees and what about suraksha bima yojana it is only 12 rupees per annum right and as i as we have just discussed there are three types of benefits available under suraksha bima yojana the three types are number one death due to accident what is the compensation 2 lakh rupees second is the permanent to total disability mind the words permanent total total disability we have understood all these terminologies while discussing the employees compensation act therefore the permanent total disability also makes the individual eligible for 2 lakh rupees compensation the third category is permanent partial disability and for that the individual gets 1 lakh rupees therefore these three are the types of benefits available under pradhan mantri suraksha bima yojana and what about the jeevan jyoti bima yojana only one class of benefit that is rupees 2 lakh for an insured person in case of death right and what is the age limit like we have already discussed for pradhan mantri suraksha bima yojana the age limit here is 18 to 70 for the pradhan mantri jeevan jyoti bima yojana it is 18 to 50 and for remembering this because this might be confusing the word s does not come in jeevan jyoti bima yojana therefore the word s comes in pradhan mantri suraksha bima yojana and therefore the age limit is 18 to 70 years this is just a trick to remember right so these are the major differences and major provisions now let us see the next question so what is the meaning of social security it may provide cash benefits to person faced with number 1 sickness and disability unemployment crop failure loss of marital partner right so now try to remember all the schemes all the acts that we have read while discussing the social security code and the nine legislation that we have read about in social security code try to remember what all acts contain the provision sickness and disability we read about the esi act in which the provisions for sickness disability were very clearly there there were pensions there were you know cash benefits for sickness right in esic therefore yes this is true social security you know com comprises of this benefit unemployment yes there were unemployment allowances in esic itself right there there was a scheme recently by the government named as bimit vyakti kalyan yojana you know run by esic that also provided for unemployment benefits what about crop failure the <clears throat> pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana in which the meager premium of you know 1.5% for rabi crops 2% for kharif crops and 2.5% for cash crops make the makes the farmer eligible for complete compensation in case of destruction of crop or crop failure so is it isn't it a social security benefit yes it is a social security benefit any benefit that is provided by the society the government to help people to tide through such phases you know such exigency in life is called as a social security scheme therefore yes crop failure also leads to you know loss of livelihood loss of property you know there there are a lot of farmer suicides because of this so it's a huge exigency therefore social security may provide cash benefits in this case loss of the marital partner yes in this case as well there can be you know benefits provided this also comes under the social security so the answer should be d because all of the above are exigencies in life and social security may provide cash benefits to persons faced with any of these right so 
Let us see the next question. Employee State Insurance Act 1948 covers factors like. So let us see what all the Employee State Insurance Act 1948 covers. We have already seen the ESI Act. So you you people should be aware or should be able to answer this question. First is factories and establishments with ten or more employees. Yes, this is true. We have seen this in the ESI Act that all the factories and establishments with ten or more employees are coverable under this Act. Second is provision of comprehensive medical care to employees and their families. Yes, this is the primary aim of ESI Act. It runs hospitals and through its hospitals it provides or it ensures comprehensive medical care to employees and their families third is provision of cash benefits during sickness and maternity yes this is also true like we have seen the establishments where or the employees who are getting benefit through esi act they are not eligible for benefits under maternity benefit act therefore esi is supplementary to the maternity benefit act like in case of esi covered employees ESI itself takes care of maternity and sickness benefits. Well, this is also true that monthly payments in case of death or disablement. Yes, this is also true that a wage at the half day rate, and in case of total disablement, also at the at some at certain rate, these wages are provided in case of monthly payments. therefore all four of them they are correct and they appear to be covered by the employee state insurance act right so answer is d in this case now we have come to pradhan mantri jeevan jyoti bima yojana like we have already discussed the scheme now so we we should be able to answer this now we have already seen the differences it is applicable to all adults above the age group of 18 years right well is it true so because there can be certain amount of confusion that the upper limit is not given but the minimum limit is given that is correct right let us read the other statements if that makes it easy the premium is deducted from the account holders bank account through auto debit facility this appears to be correct however let us move to the next statements the life insurance worth is decided by the account holder and he has to pay the annual premium accordingly is it true no the life insurance worth is already decided as we have discussed it is 2 lakhs in case of it, it is 2 lakhs in case of pradhan mantri jeevan jyoti bima yojana and the that is also fixed and the annual premium is also fixed that is rupees 330 per annum therefore third statement is not correct so let us eliminate the third one so we are left with 1 and 4 or 2 and 4 therefore either of the two that is one or two has to be wrong now so first statement is it is applicable to all adults of the age group of 18 years so if we read it more clearly now that it is applicable to the age group of 18 to 50 years therefore those who are above 50 they are not eligible for pradhan mantri jeevan jyoti bima yojana therefore the statement number 1 it becomes wrong so we are left with 2 and 4 now So let us re read the fourth statement as well. The life insurance amount is given to the family after the death of the subscriber. Yes, this is also true. Therefore, two and four is the answer. Right. This brings us to a very important question, which is very specific and very, you know, particular to labor relations, industrial relations, labor laws area. the famous giri approach in industrial relations in india espouses the cause of right so first of all who's giri here the word giri here stands for the late v v giri president of india who was also a famous labor union leader and so what about his approach so friends before answering this questions this question let us try to understand the whole concept of approaches to industrial relations right so what are the various approaches and what all is the common points or key things that you should know for this exams perspective about those various approaches so let us see those approaches so these are nine approaches so i would like you all to note down the points 
that you know the certain approaches uh, all these nine approaches they have one or two basic elements in them which separate them from the other ones therefore those one or two elements are crucial and you should try to make a note of all those points so that you can revise at the end and you you can solve the questions at least by elimination right so the first is unitary approach so unitary approach as the word suggests it is unitary completely unitary in approach unitary in the sense that it considers the management the employer side itself responsible for running this industry and it considers that any issues any disputes industrial disputes between the employees and the employers is because of failure of the management to manage the employees therefore it lays the emphasis upon the management itself to solve the industrial disputes and to bring about a positive change in the atmosphere so as the approach itself suggests here that it does not give importance to labor unions to states it does not like the intervention of state and as well it likes the problem or the industrial disputes or the industrial or the labor issues to be sorted out by the management unilaterally itself and since this approach you can see that the management has an all encompassing role this approach to an extent is one of the productive approaches that there will be no strikes there will be no you know trade union issues etc therefore this approach shall be productive however the flip side shall be that this approach will not be healthy for the employees for the workers because the management will have an overarching say an overarching you know influence in the management of the industry and the workers right rights might be compromised because it does not give significance to the unions labor unions as well as the state therefore this is the unitary approach and the second is pluralistic approach so as the name pluralistic itself suggests it considers various individuals and various groups and it assumes that the organization itself it consists of individuals who form distinct groups with their own set of aims objectives and leadership styles right and this approach prefers compromises between the management and the employees right therefore it engages with trade unions it understands the importance of state right it understand the importance of government for arbitration purposes for ensuring that the disputes are industrial disputes are settled right so this pluralistic approach differs from unitary approach in the sense that it gives significance to the labor unions to the state as well and therefore a compromise negotiation takes place between the trade union employee union and the management well the third is marxist approach like in every other schools the marxist school is always a you know one of the schools because it it has its own prism of looking at economic issues right so the marxist approach it considers the capitalist class to be owner of all the industries and it considers capitalist class as the exploitative class that the main purpose of the capitalist class or the industrialists is to exploit the workers and yield maximum benefit without compensating or without giving them the due their due to the workers right so it also does not want a role for the state because it believes that the state shall always favor the capitalist class that is the management the state shall always go with the management therefore this approach does not favor any state intervention it favors strengthening of unions strengthening of workers their unity etc for collective ownership of their enterprises for collective bargaining etc right so the next is systems approach systems approach this is also one of the approaches which are which is you know existent in economy existent in political studies etc in the systems approach there is a very scientific way of 
approaching a problem right all the stakeholders all the factors are considered so what are the factors here the factors are first the actors who all are the actors the management the employees etc there are various actors are considered second is the industry market because what happened in till now is that only the employees and the employers are being considered in the above three approaches we have not taken into consideration the other factors so what beyond the so we have actors number one we have the industrial market we have the technology or the technological factors we have the labor unions and we have the ideology mind you the ideology also plays a very key role in systems approach therefore all the factors together they decide the industrial relation all the factors together they decide the approach towards the management of disputes between the employers and the employees therefore systems approach considers industrial relation as a by product of multiple factors and those factors what are they we have discussed they are the actors they are the industrial markets the labor unions the technology and the ideology prevalent right what about the sociology approach the sociology approach it considers society to be a part of industry to be influenced by society and society to be equally influenced by the industry therefore this whole premise of sociological approach comes from the fact that it assumes factory to be an integral part of the society itself it is an inseparable from society right and how do societies and industries affect each other industries play a key role in determining social mobility urbanization transport problem family structure and size of the family etc right so the industries they just don't just provide livelihoods they are also a factor for social construct they are also a factor for multiple determinants in sociology in social relations like social mobility urbanization transport problem family structure and size of the family etc because you have seen that you know for finding jobs in cities the males have to migrate and in india the trend has been males have kept migrating leaving their spouses and families and kids behind at the at their hometowns therefore this even if the spouse and the children come along the old parents won't come along therefore the whole family structure changes and the concept of nuclear families appears from there so how crucial is industry in shaping the sociology the social construct of a society what and how does society impacts the industries it impacts the management vision mission objective employee attitude and perception and also the conflicts at the workplace right so mind you even the conflicts are governed by the society right and the issues for those conflicts they are generally oriented to the local beliefs the local ideologies etc of the society right therefore this approach is a two way approach that this industry is an inseparable part of society it influences the society and in turn society as well influences the industries so the next is gandhian approach right so gandhian approach is that industrial organization is a joint venture of employees and employers gandhi ji he denied to consider the employers or the management as the sole owner of the industries he considered that employees are the co-owners of the industry and therefore any fruits of growth should be distributed amongst the employees as well such that they feel the ownership that they already have the stakes ownership stakes in that factory or establishment therefore the fruits of growth the dividends should be distributed amongst them as well you all must have heard about the trusteeship approach of gandhi ji that gandhi ji used to say that the industrialists the owners they are as a trustees that they are holding the industry or they are running it on behalf of the 
society on behalf of the people itself and they they are not the sole owners of those industries so this is the gandhian approach and the most crucial aspect is that gandhi ji never considered strikes as illegal he always had a sympathetic approach towards the strikes right and he led one of two three major strikes in the pre british pre uh, independence era and he successfully led the ahmedabad textile mill workers strike right the champaran satyagraha the bardoli satyagraha so gandhi ji had his fair share of activism in the labor issues as well therefore this gandhian approach it however suggests for mutual conciliation conversation discussion dialogue negotiations and through peaceful means the industrial disputes should be resolved between the employees and the employers right however he had a tilt towards the workers that the strikes should be considered sympathetically now the next is psychological approach so in all the above approaches the human brain the human mind has not come into play the system the interplay the society the ideology all of it has we have seen however the psychology of the individual or the individuals and groups which run the establishment which work in the establishment they have not come into picture till now so this psychological approach it says that the main reason behind the disputes is the different perceptions and mindset of the management and the employees and therefore because of that different mindset and perceptions there is a lack of trust between the two and that lack of trust leads to industrial disputes therefore this approach suggests that major work should be done on the psychological improvement in bridging that psychological gaps in bridging that psychological misunderstandings and the industrial disputes can be sorted out through that approach therefore it would suggest that the management or the industrial establishment should hire the psychologists who can understand the psychological issues which are prevalent and try to handle all or create a reconciliation through psychological enhancement or psychological betterment approach now we reach to the vv giri approach the question which was asked in 2016 apfc exam so what is this vv giri's approach as we have discussed he was the late president and trade union leader he called for collective bargaining and mutual negotiations between the management and labor right he said that the, there should be a bipartite organization a bipartite body should exist in every establishment this bipartite body should consist of the participants from the employee side and the employer side and this body should be able to reconcile or to sort out all the industrial disputes right and he emphasized voluntary arbitration not compulsory arbitration and he advocated that most of the industrial disputes should be you know handled through the collective bargaining approach and it they should not compulsorily go for arbitration right the workers itself they should form a collective bargaining and that collective bargaining should be through a bipartite body in which both the management and the workers are a part of it right so the answer for this question the famous giri approach in industrial relations in india espouses the cause of compulsory collective bargaining should be the answer so now we are left with the ninth last one that is human relations approach and this is a mistake unitary approach you, you can ignore this because this might have been wrongly copied from here so the last is the human relations approach and this human relations approach like we have already discussed while discussing the 2012 paper that it was given by elton mayo right and it analyzes the behavior of individuals and groups at the workplace again it is similar to psychological approach however the word human relations here has been emphasized by elton mayo in the sense that the the approach stresses for improving the morale 
the efficiency, the communication skills, the group dynamics, right? So it tries to establish through human relations manager, human relations executive, a permanent channel. That channel has multifarious role. Its role is not just to ensure communication and to the two-way communication between the management and the employees. However, its role also is to boost the morale of the employees, boost the efficiency and also look after the group dynamics of the company. Therefore, this human relations approach, the appointment of permanent HR human relations executives, human relations experts, it leads to a permanent mechanism which ensures reconciliation and sorting out of industrial disputes. So, friends, these were the nine major approaches. There can be other approaches. However, I could come across these nine major approaches only. So, they are the approaches to industrial relations. I hope you all have noted down the important points and please revise them so that you can easily able to, you are easily able to answer the questions. So let us see the next question. Which of the following are the typical differences between the private insurance programs and the social insurance programs? Right, so it, it is again a duplicacy that it is, so the answer, the question should have ended here after the social insurance. So which of the following are typical differences between the private insurance programs and the social insurance programs, right? So let us examine the options adequacy versus equity, right? What does the word adequacy means? That the benefits which are accruing to individuals should be adequately available to all the persons, all the insured persons who have been insured through that insurance program. What about equity? equity? Equity is somehow called as the ownership stakes, the ownership rights which are given. So very clear from the, the word private insurance programs itself that the private insurance programs, they generally look for equity, that the available benefits, the available pool of benefits is equally divided amongst the number of insured persons, the number of applicants. Therefore, the private insurance programs would look for equity. However, the social insurance programs, which are generally run by the government only, they look for adequacy. They try to see whether the adequate amount of benefits are available to the employees or not. Right. It does not see for equity because the, the amount or the benefits that is to be distributed to the insured persons, it is not fixed and the money that is available is not fixed like in case of private social insurance program. The second is voluntary versus mandatory participation. Right. So if we have to compare the private insurance programs, they are generally voluntary in nature. Right. Because you all must have heard the ad through policy bazaar etc. that a lot of insurance schemes are available and a lot of a lot of insurers the insurance agencies are available to choose from right so therefore this whole system of private insurance programs it is voluntary and the social insurance programs they are generally mandatory like in case of epf and mp act and esi act we all have seen the statutory provisions that there is no option. The schemes are not optional. That an employee cannot say that even if I am eligible for the benefits, I am denying that or I don't want these benefits because the op schemes are not optional, not voluntary. They are mandatory. Therefore, the social insurance programs are generally mandatory in for participation and the private ones are voluntary. What are the what is the third contractual versus statutory rights? Generally, these private programs that we just discussed, they are born through a contract between the insured person and the private agency. However, the statutory, the social insurance programs like the EPFO, ESIC, they are through statutory rights. They are through one or the other statute. The 
law of the land law made by the parliament or the state governments in some cases therefore the very clear difference between the private and social insurance programs is that the private ones are through contract however the social insurance programs are through statutes for example the employees provident fund and miscellaneous provisions act 1952 lays the foundation for the employees provident fund organization the epfo the epf scheme the pension scheme and the employees deposit linked insurance scheme funding what about the funding well the private insurance programs they have to be funded through a mechanism through the insured persons only the whole model has to run in the manner that the total amount of premiums collected should never be more than the compensation that is being provided to the eligible persons so on that premise itself the whole insurance private model runs so therefore the funding has to be self funded that is funded by the insured persons only however what about the social insurance programs the mechanism for funding is generally through a tripartite or bipartite methods the government the employee the employer all have to pool in right therefore the funding mechanism differs for example we have seen in case of epf and mp act the funding is done by the a certain percentage is given by the employee by the employer and in case of pension scheme employees pension scheme run by epfo government also contributes its bit towards the pension therefore the funding mechanism for the private insurance programs and the social insurance programs are very different therefore which of the following are typical differences all of them they appear to be typical differences therefore d is the answer in this case now the next question is consider the following statements in respect of atal pension yojana well so this these are also very factual questions beneficiary must be in the age group of 18 to 40 years you have to learn this by heart that yes the age group is 18 to 40 years only beneficiary will receive the pension only after he attains the age of 60 years yes this provision also goes with the atal pension yojana that most of the pension schemes like the pradhan mantri shram yogi mandhan yojana pradhan mantri lagu vyapari mandhan yojana all of them they have the eligibility age of 60 years right and they also have the contributory age group in 18 to 40 years itself so this remains common to the atal pension yojana and the new pradhan mantri shram yogi mandhan yojana or lagu vyapari mandhan yojana right so beneficiary will receive the pension only after he attains the age of 60 years this also appears to be true right after the death of beneficiary his spouse continues to receive the pension yes this is also true this provision is also similar to the pradhan mantri shram yogi mandhan yojana and the lagu vyapari mandhan yojana that we have been discussing no nominee of the beneficiary is permitted is it true no it is not true the nominee shall be permitted in the atal pension yojana therefore first second and three c seems to be the answer a few other things about atal pension yojana friends that the monthly pension after attainment of age of 60 years it ranges from 1000 to 5000 right so first is the what is the corpus of pension that is amount of pension received that is 1000 to 5000 rupees and the tax benefits they are very similar as in case of nps right so the deductions in, in the income tax is very same as provided for the nps and who runs the atal pension yojana it is the pfrda pension fund regulatory regulatory and development authority it's not the epfo or ministry of labor the pfrda is under the ministry of finance therefore you all should have to remember it that pfrda under ministry of finance runs the atal pension yojana the available benefit available pension is 1000 to 5000 years a new change however has been made that 
for nps i would like to tell a few points here because we have there has no, not been any question on nps so i would consider nps to be an important topic for this year's exam that for nps two new changes have been made one the age group which has been revised to 18 to 65 for nps and not for atal pension yojana therefore for nps the age group has become 18 to 65 and earlier the non residents the non resident indians were not allowed to to be a part of nps now they have been allowed therefore these are the two key changes in nps scheme therefore 1 2 3 is the answer so what is the next question what are the disadvantage of provident fund scheme now this is a trick question can there be some disadvantage of provident fund scheme as well the answer lies in the question itself it has to be based on the sentence itself or the you know construct of the sentence let us read them money is inadequate for risks occurring early in life right so if we assess the scheme what it does is it take away the 25% of salary of an individual so yes at times it might appear to the individual that the money one is getting after deductions under epf is inadequate for the risks which are occurring you know so the at times one might might, might get frustrated that my current needs are not getting fulfilled at the cost of savings for future i mean what is the use of such saving so therefore it can be considered as a disadvantage of provident fund second is inflation erodes the real value of savings right good enough that if even if the interest rate like currently interest rate of around 8% every year is provided by the employees provident fund organization however if the inflation which we have lately seen is in the higher side of 6 if it continues like that therefore the value of money it keeps eroding it keeps getting eroded therefore the real value of savings is not as much as one would have saved at the beginning therefore both these are because one is about to get the money at the retirement at the time of retirement therefore inflation will keep eroding the value of those savings this is also true third is it generates forced saving that can be used to finance national development plans well this is also true that in a way it generates forced saving which can be used to finance national development plans however can this be considered as a disadvantage of provident fund scheme no because it is in a way an advantage through which the national development plans <clears throat> the goal of national development can be achieved so the answer is 1 and 2 in this case so friends these were the 10 questions which were from the social security labor laws and industrial relations area so next time we will start with a new topic thank you